All right, this week we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to start out here in verse 1. It's a good place to start when you're doing an expository study. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others." Okay, very interesting there, and you can see a definite distinction between saved and lost there. Okay, we're in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Say something more about that in a minute. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, lost people, among whom we also, uh, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. In other words, God's not saying, you know, well, I understand that there's a lot of carnal Christians out there that are still doing most of these things, and that's okay because they're just carnal Christians. No, they're, again, the Bible teaches that there needs to be a changed life after salvation. And we'll see that as we continue through the book of Ephesians. But I want you to notice there the very unique statement in verse 2. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. How does God, or the God of this world, I'll say it that way, how does Satan get control of so many people? He's not omnipresent like God is. So what, how does he work? How does he do things? Through the air. You say, well, so in other words, the stuff we're breathing, you know, shouldn't breathe? No, that's not it. What Satan uses is he uses radio waves. He uses television waves, cell phone waves. He uses all these electronic waves to get to people. That's why I say a lot of times that television is satanic. Okay, now can you put something good on that medium? Can you put something through there that's, that's good and things like that? Yeah, you can. But see, the one who's in control of it is going to work through the children of disobedience. That's what your Bible says right there. Very interesting. And it's interesting too because what does television, what does a lot of this media, what does it do? What is it, what is it intended to do? It says here in, in verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation. A conversation in your King James Bible can mean speaking, but it can also mean your behavior. In times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Did you know that there is not one thing that is a lust of the flesh that you can't... I should. How can I say this? There's not one thing that is considered a lust of the flesh that you can't readily see on television. You can see it all the time. You can see fornication. You can see adultery. You can see drunkenness. You can see witchcraft. Definitely, it's very popular now on television. You can see all these different things. All these things that the Bible calls sin, all these lusts of the flesh, they're all over television. I mean, they're, they're even doing the news now with, with women with low-cut tops on, you know, and, and good-looking women. Why? Supermodels telling you what the daily news is. Political commentators and things like that. Huh? What is that? Appealing to the lusts of the flesh? Why? Because there's a spirit behind it. You know, and I've made mention different times of doing a study on the thing of, of television and things like this, the mind control of television. Uh, you say, why haven't you done that yet? Well, a number of reasons. First of all, it's going to take a huge amount of, of uh, work. Uh, I'm not afraid of that, but it takes me away from other projects. And when I say a huge amount of work, what I'm saying is hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of watching television programming so I can get just little small, just a couple second clips here and a couple second clips there. I mean, that just as a, for instance, the Jack Hiles study that I did a few weeks ago there, um, that study, I had to watch many, many, many hours of video 
and you only get a couple seconds here and a couple seconds there and a couple here and a couple there. And you have to go in and you have to put that into the video program. Then you have to cut those little sections out and you have to watch the more and then cut that section out. I'll watch these videos two or three times be getting all the stuff together. And it might take me, you know, just the introduction to that video, the Jack Hiles thing, the Jack Hiles introduction. That thing took me three days to put that together taking all those clips and getting everything to, to go in right and sync in right and getting the music lined up and everything else, putting the text in and getting everything to just come out just timed perfectly. You know, takes a long time. So number one, the television thing would take me a long time to show examples of, of them using mind control tactics. But secondly, using television there would be copyright stuff all over the place. It probably, I probably couldn't even put the thing on YouTube. So that's another reason why I'm like, you know, what's the point of it? And, you know, I realized I could put it on Sermon Audio and, you know, that might be something more in the future. Uh, the brother that takes care of that channel for me, um, he, you know, sent me an email and I, I did get it and everything and was saying I really don't even need YouTube, you know, as, as far as, you know, I can go through sermon audio if youtube shuts me down i can just do sermon audio which is true but you know um there's a lot of people that are that are on youtube that don't know about sermon audio so you know i do need to promote that channel more often on sermon audio um and i don't know if i could get away with it on sermon audio either because they have they talk about you know you shouldn't use copyrighted things and stuff i didn't i had some problems with that back when i had my first uh, you, sermon audio page, uh, the Bible Believers Fellowship there. Some issues with the copyright thing. So again, can I really do a study on this thing of television and mind control? I don't know. Um, that's It's still on the back burner. I still have, I'm still collecting information <laughs> as time goes by. I have a little folder there, like I talked about last week. I have a little folder on my desktop that I throw the information into. You know, I've, I find a good video that proves the mind control or show this or show that. I stick it into that little folder and, um, you know, as time goes by, the folder's getting bigger and eventually I'd like to do a study, but we'll see. But it all goes back to this thing right here. The prince of the power of the air, he is getting to control people um, through television. You know, and, and I've probably told this story before, but I'll tell it one other time. And that is, uh, I remember going fishing the one night and uh, well, afternoon, and it, it got dark, and my brother-in-law and I were driving back, and he was driving his truck, and I was sitting in the passenger seat, you know, and we're driving along, and I just I got to thinking about the Antichrist system, and, and how's this whole thing going to come in, and I'm just kind of looking out the window, and we're going through this little town, and we're going past house after house after house, and they all had one thing in common. They all had a unique blue, bluish glow coming from one of the rooms. You know, and I'm looking at I'm like, all these people are watching television. There's a TV, there's a TV, there's a, you know, you'd have one or two might, that, that, that the blue glow wasn't there. But most of the people, they're watching television. Most people have televisions on in their homes. And that spirit there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, it's coming into your home via that television. You have a receiver, television receiver, that's receiving that air, those airwaves. Coming through the air and you're picking it up. Is that really something that you want in your home? Tell you what, something to think about. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter two, verses fifteen and sixteen. It says here, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. I like this verse, next one, verse sixteen. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things. <laughs> you know, to the lost world they look at us like we're zombies, like we're dead. They see that we are dead, you know. There in uh, chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, we were actually dead back when we were lost. But now we're alive unto Christ. 
but the lost world that's still dead, they look at us being alive and they say, oh no, you're actually the ones that are dead. It's like, no, actually you are. <laughs> uh, it's just kind of funny. And it's interesting because when you meet another Christian out in public someplace or whatever, you're out witnessing and you hand a tract to a Christian, they go, actually I am saved, you know, and you, and you get to talking and, and you have that fellowship. It's a savor of life unto life. That person's saved. Praise the Lord. Wow, it's so neat to meet you. It's a neat thing to meet another Christian. But you talk to the lost world, they're dead and trespasses and sins. They have no idea what's going on. If you remember last week up there in chapter 1, it talks about the eyes of your understanding, you know, being enlightened. You can see what's going on. You can really understand. Why? Because you're alive. Those people that are dead in trespasses and sins, those lost people, they don't understand. You can see it in the comments here on my videos. You know, you'll get these people, I don't understand what you're trying to, what point you're trying to make by this video. I don't, you're crazy. You're stupid. This is, eh. what's the problem? They're dead. Yeah. Let's get back to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 4 through 6. It says here, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Look at verse 6. This is very interesting. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hmm. If you remember last week's study, talked about there are ten references to being in Christ in the book of Ephesians. Now here's the interesting thing. While it is true that we are still bodily here on the earth, while it is true that we are predestinated to be to go to heaven there when we die, you don't go to heaven right away in body, but guess what? Your spirit is there. You are, right there it says, verse 6, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You say, Brian, are you going to go to heaven when you die? I'm already there. What? You know, sure, I'm sitting there with Jesus Christ. I'm in Christ Jesus, aren't I? I'm part of his body. So, in spirit, I'm already there. Now, body, soul, down here. If my body dies, well, my soul goes up. My body's still going to be down here. You dig up the grave of D.L. Moody or, of, you know, whoever old saint from the past or whatever, their body's still here on the earth. Their soul's not. Their soul's in heaven. So, if you're saved, if you are a Christian, you already have one foot in heaven, so to speak. Okay? One third of you is in heaven. Two thirds are on the earth. If you die before the rapture, two-thirds are in heaven, one-third's on the earth. At the rapture, you're totally three-thirds, you know. Every part of you is up there in heaven with the Lord. Looking forward to that for sure. Look at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Do you want God's kindness? I sure do. I like things like God's mercy, God's long-suffering, God's patience, God's grace, and I like His kindness, too. You know, I knew a brother the one time that said that uh, he wanted God to be rough with him. I don't. I don't. I want God to, to tell me what I'm doing wrong, but I want His grace. I want His mercy. I want Him to be kind to me. You know? I don't want God to allow bad things to happen to me. Why? Well, I've been through some of that stuff in the past. I've been through some of the chastening of the Lord. It's not fun. Why? You say, well, why was that, Brian? If I was messing around with the flesh. I had to get a few whippings, a couple spankings from the Lord. It wasn't fun. I want His kindness. You say, well, then you just you know plead for that while you're living in sin. No, no. I try to clean up my life and try to stay away from sinning so I don't have to experience His punishment, His judgment. The Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's very important to remember that. But another kind of an interesting little tie-in here. Um, what is your relationship to God the Father? You say, well, we're His children. But born in by the spirit of adoption. That's true. Interesting because the German word for children is 
Kinder. Now you spell that out, it's K-I-N-D-E-R. I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, it's like we want God to be kinder. <laughs> you know, the German there, the Deutsche is, is Kinder, you know. Which is, by the way, where our word kindergarten comes from. You know, just thought that was kind of interesting. We are God's children, and we want Him to be kinder to us. Little nugget there from the original German, you know. <laughs> just uh, interesting. Next, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? One of the best questions that you can ask to a lost person is, if you can earn your salvation, why did Jesus die on the cross? Who did Jesus die for if you can be good enough to get to heaven? You know, maybe the really, really bad people, you know. And you're better than the really, really bad people? That's a good one. I've seen that, you know, self-righteous people. It kind of stumps them. You know, and they'll, they'll, you'll see them like just kind of sitting there. They'll work on it and then they'll come out with some kind of thing to skirt the issue. But uh, I've talked to numerous lost people and I ask them that question and every single one of them, it stumps them. At least for a few seconds, anyhow, you'll see them, they kind of think and they're like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ died for you. Why? Because you're a good person, you can work your way in? No. You're not going to get in by your own works. And coming to God and saying, I'm a sinner, that's not works. What's being condemned in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 there is good works. I'm a good person. That's what the majority of people think. They can't imagine themselves having to go to hell and burn for eternity. They think that they're good people. They think, I'm, I can get in by my works, my good works, you know. If you want to talk about works to get saved, you have to come to God and prove that you're a sinner, which all of us can do. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. You come along and you say, I'm rotten, I'm wicked. That's the right attitude. It's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. See? I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Over and over again, you have to come to God as a sinner. It's that simple. Just be honest enough to, to admit that you're not good enough to get to heaven. That's what's being condemned there. All right? This nutty nonsense of easy believism that says, you coming and saying, I'm a sinner, and I, need to, I understand that those sins are keeping me from God, and that these, you know, I need to turn from that thing after I get saved. That, they say, oh, that's work salvation. That's not work salvation. It never has been. Work salvation is people that are boasting, lest any man should boast. Verse 9 there. See? How are you going to boast about being a sinner? It doesn't work. But let's continue. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Before you get saved? No. This verse comes after salvation. Right there. 8 and 9. There you're saved. By grace are you saved through faith. And then the good works come. So Paul's clarifying. He's saying, you're saved by the grace of God, by your faith in Jesus Christ. And you say, well, then I don't have to do any good works. Oh, no, no, no. Because the works come after salvation. Let me show you that. Acts chapter 26, verse 20. Acts 26, verse 20 says here, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Wait a second. You got to do works after you're saved? Mm -hmm. Works meet for repentance. What does that mean? Works that prove that you have turned, that you have changed turn to God, you know, there's been a change in your life. You know, the old hymn, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And that's called heresy now by many of the brethren. Well, they call themselves brethren, excuse me, false brethren. You know, 
What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. It's not some kind of a false, horrible, evil thing or whatever else. It's a good thing. Don't you think when you get saved, a few things are going to change? Yeah, absolutely. Turn next to Titus chapter 1, verse 16. So you see that there that you should have works meet for repentance. You say, well, uh, is there any kind of verse showing that people that don't have works, that their professions were in vain? Let's look about that. Titus 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto, unto every good work reprobate. So you have people that profess that they know God, but you look at the works. They don't believe the King James Bible. They're not living a separated, consecrated life after being saved. And I'm not talking about somebody that just got saved and they're still having trouble with the flesh or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you get these people saved for 20, 30 years and they'll get angry when you talk to them about the Lord or separation or whatever Bible type of truths and they're just wicked. You know, they might profess that they know God, but their works, they're denying Him. It's just like, no, sorry, I don't think so. You know, I mean, Jack Hiles, just to give you an example, Jack Hiles. I looked into him and at first I thought, well, I think he's maybe he was saved and stuff and, you know, maybe he just was carnal and, and uh, you know, just kind of got mixed up and whatever else. And I thought, okay, number one, where was the chastening? He prospered, left behind $70 million worth of real estate. Where was the conviction? Why is it that he was covering up for his own sins and the sins of his own son? 30 documented cases of adultery that David Hiles had. And Jack Hiles covered up the whole thing. Would a saved man do that? You say, well, I think so. Okay, what about uh, the, his own, the allegations of his own affair? He's telling people it's none of your business. You know? And what about the fact that blatant idolatry that was coming upon him and things and he didn't, you know, you see the guys in the Bible and people are bowing down to him and they're, he's going, they're going, stand up, don't do that to me. I'm just a man, you know, don't know. Jack Hiles is just, you know, I mean, you see him at one point, he comes out and he's doing his, his thing and, he, and he's like, and the people are cheering and he goes like this, like, come on, come on, more, 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 you know? And you look at this stuff and you weigh it out and you go, he professes that he know God, knows God, but boy, those works. In works, he denies him. In works, the, the students there and, the, and that whole system, you, you weigh it all out. You look at it from Scripture and you say, these people are proud, they're arrogant, whatever. I don't think so. I don't think they're genuine converts. And yes, we can judge that type of a thing. And it's important that we do. Because what's happening is Satan is raising up all these false ministries like this to make Bible believers look bad. There's a lot of people out there that hate King James Bible believers. Why? Because of Jack Hiles and his cult. That's a bad thing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to jump down to verse 11 now. Ephesians 2, verse 11 through 13. says here, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Not the death. Not the love. Or whatever. The blood of Christ. We were purchased by God's blood. There in Acts chapter 20. All right, that's very important. You have been adopted into the family of God, into God's family, whereby in the past you were strangers to that covenant that God had with the nation of Israel. You know, my ancestors, my German ancestors, were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. I couldn't just have walked in there back, you know, around, you know, a thousand or so years before Christ, you know, back then, and just, Come walking into Israel, hi everybody, I'm a Jew. You know, they'd be like, What are you? You know, you don't even speak Hebrew here. You're speaking, you know, whatever it would have been back then, you know. 
So my ancestors would have been strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. Now look, look at verse 14 here. Ephesians 2 verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in the flesh, in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. I thought that was very interesting. You see, there's a lot of people that try to talk about racial equality and equality among the sexes and all this other stuff. We want to bring everybody together and just have equality. But they want to do it without Jesus Christ. It's not possible. The only way to have racial equality, to have equality among men and women, is by them to be saved. Isn't it interesting that everything that God does, man tries to copy, but taking God out. They say, we want racial equality, but we don't want it through Jesus Christ. The Lord says, sorry, not going to happen. We want to have equality between men and women, but without Jesus Christ. The Lord says, no, not going to happen. They say, we want to have mansions here on earth. The Lord says, and they say, we want to have a mansion, but without Jesus Christ. The Lord says, no, sorry, you can have your little shack down there on the earth, but it's not going to compare to what we have up in heaven. We want to have riches. We want to have perfect health. We want to have, you know, we don't want to die someday. All these things that they want to do, but they try to take Jesus Christ out of the equation. It doesn't work. It never will. Very interesting. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. I'll show you this thing here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 through 29. It says here, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one, in, you see it there again, in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Are you in Christ? You say yes. Okay, then we're equal. You say, well, Brian, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I've got these little flies flying around in here yet, little fruit flies. So if you see me going like this or like this, you know, I'm not going crazy. It's just <laughs> little flies. But you say, Brian, um, I'm a woman. How can I be equal with you if I'm a woman? Are you in Christ? Then we're equal. You say, uh, I'm of a different kindred than you. Are we equal? If you're in Christ, we're equal. You know? You get somebody who's an Orthodox Jew and they're, you know, can trace their lineage the whole way back through, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their descendant, you know, one of the 12 tribes. Are you in Christ? We're equal. That's what's going on there in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Okay, we're one now. Interesting. Romans chapter 2. Go to Romans chapter 2. And I'm going to show you some things here. Romans chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Look at this, verse 11. This is very important. For there is no respect of persons with God. That's an important thing to get. There's no respect of persons with God. You see, now, does that mean that God is done with the Jews and God's not going to have any specific prophecies for the nation of Israel? No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that God, in terms of salvation, he's no respecter of persons. God doesn't care what race you are. Now, race is not a Bible word, I know that. But kindred is a Bible word there. God doesn't care what kindred you are in terms of salvation. Now, in terms of covenants and promises... Totally different story. God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's going to keep that covenant to the Jewish people. That is there. But in terms of salvation, God doesn't care what kindred you are. God doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. God doesn't care about your body size, if you're overweight or really skinny, or what your age, the color of your hair. What God is no respecter of persons. 
you need to get a hold of that thing there. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 through 19. Ephesians 2, verse 17. It says here, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. In other words, those that are far off are the Gentiles. Those that are nigh are the Jews. Verse 18, For through him, Jesus Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. In other words, there's not some kind of special Holy Spirit for the Jews and a Holy Spirit for Gentile believers. No, it's not there. It's one Spirit. One body, one Spirit. We're going to see that when we get to chapter 4 in this book of Ephesians. Verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Okay? You know, and again, these verses prove another big problem for the replacement theology heretics. You say, why is that? Well, they want to teach you that the land of Israel, the nation of Israel, that physical land over there in Jerusalem, Israel, you know, Jerusalem, the capital city, that physical area is done away with. Well, then why would we be called strangers and foreigners? We're no more strangers and foreigners there, it says, you know, verse 19, um, a stranger and a foreigner is somebody that doesn't belong in a certain land. So that land is still here. It's still here and there's still promises. But it's saying, if you want to be part of that, if you want to be born into that, then you get saved. And if you are in Christ Jesus, then you're no more a stranger or a foreigner to the physical land of Israel. You're born in through a spirit of adoption. And God's no respecter of persons. God will let you in no matter what you are. If you're saved, if you are in Christ, then you have that inheritance that's coming to you. Let's look at Romans chapter 9, verse 3. Romans chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. It says here, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. It doesn't say according to the Spirit. See, again, the old uh, replacement theology heretics will try to say, Well, we're all spiritual Jews. As spiritual Jews is all it's talked about. Right there, Paul is making it very clear that he is referring to the physical Jews. His kindred there, his kinsmen according to the flesh. You say, well, who is it? You know, Paul might have been a, a you know, a descendant of Japheth. No, keep reading. Verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So you see there, God came for one nation. They rejected him and so salvation came to all people. Now God's no respecter of persons. You see how that thing works? A lot of the replacement theology people don't. You know? They seem to just kind of conveniently look past those verses. Let's just not really talk about that. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom, also, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Okay? You say, well, right there, see, Brian, that gives us justification to have a holy building called a church. Well, if you're talking about the people being the building, then yeah, I agree with that. So how can people be a building? Stick with me. I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. We'll be coming back here to Ephesians chapter 2 in just a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 13. We'll see about this foundation. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For ye, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, 
I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Now look at this. Okay, you say, wait a second, Paul laid the foundation, so Paul must be the foundation. No, no, keep reading. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So when you witness to somebody, you tell them you need to get saved by Jesus Christ, and they believe in Jesus Christ, they put their faith in him, he's the foundation. You say, what do you build on top of it? Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, Jesus Christ, in other words, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So when you get saved, Jesus Christ is the foundation, and now you start to build upon that foundation. And those first three there, gold, silver, precious stones, they'll make it through fire. They're fireproof. Okay? Wood, hay, stubble won't. That'll get burned down. I have a whole thing on what the gold and silver and precious stones and what the wood hay stubble is. My study on the judgment seat of Christ. You can look it up here on YouTube. So I get into a lot more detail there. But the point is, Jesus Christ is the foundation and we built upon that. I'll talk about more about this in just a minute. And while I'm talking about this, let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. I want to kick the Catholics system again. Matthew chapter 16. Because one of their primary teachings is that Peter was the first pope and that Jesus Christ built the church on Peter. And now we have apostolic succession that we can go from Peter and up to the modern day with Pope Francis. And it's all unbroken line of succession, which is nonsense. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I'm going to show you that the very foundation of their teaching is wrong. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I say unto thee, also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you say, well, the, see, that Peter's the, the foundation there. No, you just read about over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the rock of our salvation. So you build upon Jesus Christ. You build your, your house there upon Jesus Christ. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Read these verses again because I want to illustrate something. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You say, could you illustrate that? Absolutely. I have my... I had to dig through my uh, belongings here. My old thing of Legos from when I was a boy. I'll try to resist the temptation to not sit here and play with these and get distracted from the sermon. But you know, what we have, uh, let me get a couple more here. Just to illustrate what the New Testament church is, here you have, where's my remote? Let me zoom in here a little bit so I can illustrate this a little bit better. All right. Here we have the foundation. Okay? You need the foundation to build upon. So you have, here comes a little Christian along. Now, he's got the foundation of Jesus Christ. Down here, he's building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Then you have this other little one here. He comes here. He's not quite as big as the first Christian, you see. And then you have another one come along. Then you have another one come along. What are you illustrating? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. You see, what is that? 
Well, that's what a picture of a true New Testament church is. You see, we all have the foundation of Jesus Christ, and when we come together, we start to click. You see? You come and you meet that Christian that's a saver of life unto life, and you say, do you believe the King James Bible? They say, there's no other Bible. The other ones are from the Vatican. Oh, wow, yeah. Saver of life unto life. It, you kind of click together, you know? You fit together. You say, um, do you think things are getting better? No. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in the news every day. It's amazing. Click. You see, we fit together. Now, I'm not saying that Christians are going to be perfectly in agreement. They're, you know, we see through a glass darkly right now. I understand that. You know, we don't understand things perfectly. I'm not going to be perfect in my doctrinal stands and, and whatever else. I'm going to mess up at times. I have messed up at times. But the point is, there's the foundation, Jesus Christ. And we as Christians are built upon that foundation. We should click together. I mean, if I brought in a Lincoln log and said, oh, see, this is part of this church here, you'd say it doesn't click together. See, it has to be a Lego to all work together there. And what the Christians have been doing down through the centuries is we've been clicking into this foundation and we're building up and building up and building up and building up. And the verse says there, verse 20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And now this is very interesting because you see in the occult world they have the pyramid and up on top of it is a levitating eyeball, you know, the eye of Horus there, Lucifer, essentially. Back of your dollar bill, you can look that up. But what is that? Well, it's a counterfeit of what Jesus Christ is going to build. You see, Jesus Christ is the foundation, but he's also the head of the corner. He's also up there. He fills all in all. You see, that temple there of the Lord that's going to be in heaven someday, New Jerusalem, the holy city, it's all going to be us as the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of it and also the foundation of it. Hmm. And each one of us are little blocks, little building blocks, part of that church. And you say, well, Brian, uh, isn't it okay, though, if we as Christians meet in a building that we call a church? You know, it's not going to damn us to hell or anything, is it? No, it's not going to damn you to hell. You say, well, then why do you have such a problem with that? Why do you make so many slams on the Babel buildings and stuff like that? Well, because of the fact that it creates a two, you know, a uh, separate life. You have your life when you're in church and your life when you're not in church. And so you do certain things away from church that you would never do while you're in church. That's why I have a big problem with it. I've been through that whole thing and, and whatever else. I'm not going to keep beating that thing to death here. But, you know, the point is we need to understand from Scripture right there, Ephesians 2, verses 20 through 22, the church of Jesus Christ. There is only one church, by the way, too. I don't, you know, they say about, do you believe in a universal church? Well, saved Christians, yes, I do. I don't believe that there are multiple churches. There's only one church. Many members, but one church. Of course, we're going to be talking about that in another week or two coming up here. But the fact is, you know, there this whole thing of church buildings, it goes back to Catholicism, like I've documented many times. And you, it takes you away from that understanding that you're in church all the time. And you're supposed to act like you're in church all the time. It's very, very important. So that's going to do it for Ephesians chapter 2. Um, we will close here, I guess, with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, uh, that we are part of your body, and that we can know that we are in Christ, and that we have obtained an inheritance, Lord, and that and that uh, you don't look at us and, and judge us by our outward appearance or, or whatever, Lord, as far as uh, in terms of salvation. You'll save anybody. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that, that uh, we are accepted in the Beloved and that we can say that we are seated together with you in heavenly places right now. And that you have quickened us, Lord, that, that, that uh, as your word said in, in chapter 1, that the eyes of our understanding are, are opened, that enlightened. I thank you, Lord, that we're not left in the dark down here, that 
stumbling around in, in spiritual blindness, but we can know the truth. And Lord, if there's anybody listening to this study that does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would get that fixed up today. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that each of us would stay encouraged and uh, just remember our standing with you and that we are part of a holy family that no one can take us out of. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. That's going to be it for this week. Um, just remember who you are. Remember where you're going when you die. And um, keep that in mind when you go through some of the rough times that we all go through down here on the earth. And uh, keep it in mind too, brethren, that you are in church all the time. Uh, you don't get any time off from, from your service to the Lord. There's no such thing as saying, well, I'm not really in church right now, so I'm, I can tell you this joke. Or I can, I'm not really in church right now, so I can watch this thing. Come here, watch it. you got to see this video on YouTube. I, it's not, I wouldn't share this with other people, but you know. You're in church all the time, brethren. Don't forget that. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching. We will see you next week.